Hey everyone, and welcome to uh, another episode of Vim After Dark Live, the uh, happy hour uh, edition. Um, this is actually episode 10, believe it or not, so um, thank you all for joining me today. Um, if you haven't done so yet, and you enjoy the content here, make sure that you uh, subscribe. So uh, subscribe and get notified. It's the, uh, the best way for you to uh, stay notified for when these episodes go live. We are um, typically, uh, right now, it's been Thursday nights at 7.30, and um, <clears throat> it's been a lot of fun. So um, I'm going to be watching the chat. I have a special guest with me tonight, which uh, I'm going to introduce in a second. Um, so feel free to ask questions, uh, chat along, and, uh, and uh, try and make this a conversation between, between us. Um, I want to I wanna hear from you, and I know you guys want to hear from me. So tonight, I have a special guest, uh, Michael Kilkelly from Arc Smarter. Some of you may f be familiar with Arc Smarter. Um, I'll let him introduce himself and talk to you or tell you a little bit about himself before we jump into content. So, Michael, thanks for joining me, man. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for the invite. Of course. So uh, maybe tell everyone about yourself real quick. Yeah. But uh, before I start, though, Jeff and I live about, what, like an hour? I don't, <laughs> no, I don't even think it's an hour minutes? anymore. Yeah, it's 40 minutes. Yeah. And, and, uh, 40 minutes from each other. <laughs> I was, and we only ever run into each other at conferences. It's, yeah, it's bizarre, huh? Usually <laughs> on the other side of the country. So I, I remember we try the, to arrange. Yeah, I remember the first yeah. time we made the connection was, uh, I think it was at Bim 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 Breakfast or Bim and Bagels or whatever it was in uh, in Connecticut, uh, yeah, and that's yeah, when we yeah. that's when we made the connection that oh my goodness we're both in Connecticut like this is, right. this is bizarre, yes. <laughs> and yeah. we're still now not even in person because of uh, what's going on in yeah, the world. Yeah, exactly. And, but yeah, we actually. Connecticut natives and two two Revit bloggers from Connecticut. Go figure. <laughs> Small state. I, right, right. Yeah, the odds are astronomical. But, exactly, exactly. But again, thanks for the invitation. I'm super happy to be here. It's always fun to, uh, it's always fun to connect. You know, virtually or in person. So um, that's great. Uh, a little bit about me, um, just to get into kind of my backstory and then my. The backstory and then the front story. So we'll we'll start at the back. But I'm an architect, uh, trained as an architect, uh, practiced, you know, for 20 years or so, and um, I worked for a number of firms in New England area. And then I spent um, some time out in LA. I worked at Frank Gehry's office for about seven years. Um, and while working there, that's kind of what got me to you know what I'm doing now through Arc Smarter and kind of my my trajectory. Um, so a little bit about that. I was um, at Gary's office and I was hired uh, on a really big project. And I was kind of the new guy, so I had to do a lot of the grunt work. And the grunt work at that time, uh, this is kind of a little secret, but they use a lot of AutoCAD in addition to all the other 3D <laughs> software. So I was like the AutoCAD guy, and I had to do a, a lot of packaging up of drawings and, you know, just like binding x all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, anytime that we got to an end of a deadline on this project, I was the one who was staying late, getting the drawings ready and all that. Uh, and it was painful because it would take, you know, eight, nine hours after the deadline was over to do that. So I started um, just for my own self-preservation, started getting interested in automation and looking at, um, you know, how to learn, like how to program. And I've, I've tried numerous times before to learn a program um, in grad school and, and even after that and never took. And so it wasn't until I had a real uh, desperate need to be able to do it is that I, that it actually um, made some sense. And I wrote some horrible scripts at the beginning, but they, um, they actually did the job and I started getting Getting, you know, better and better. So this nine-hour process, I got it down to four, to three, to two, and then you know, all of a sudden at the end, I had a, at the end of the project, I had like a suite of tools that I had made that I could kind of hand off to other people, and they could do that process. So that got me really thinking about ways that I could automate, you know, this the tedious tasks that I didn't want to do anymore. Um, and then I've kind of carried that on in 2012. Um, wanted to move back to New England with my family, so. Um, at that point, I started Arc Smarter and started doing consulting, um, and I still do consulting with Gary's office. And a lot of what I do now is kind of what I was doing then. I'm doing sort of automation and looking at automation through various uh, different lenses. Um, still in AutoCAD? No, <laughs> uh, you know, occasionally I do. Yeah, and it's like, oh man, um, the majority is through Revit, but I do have to. Yeah, I have to dip into. Uh, it's still yeah, there. It's still like, around. I know. It's we all. Still we all... Around. It doesn't. We it's like a zombie. It. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and when I use it, I'm like, hey, it is good for what it does. Right. Right. right, right. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and even at Gary's office now, like they're a mix of AutoCAD, Revit, and they still use Katia. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, you know, it's trying to make all of that stuff work together, which is, which is a challenge. Oh, I'm um, sure. I'm sure. 
<laughs> but yeah, it, it's uh, Revit's a lot more fun for me, you know, and, and certainly um, automating in Revit. I always like if I have to get into into AutoCAD, I'm like, you know, I wish there was Dynamo for AutoCAD. <laughs> a lot of the stuff there's Auto less, but that's yeah. just horrible. Um, <laughs> so I tried try to avoid that. You're but exactly uh, right. tonight, again, when when Jeff invited me. You know, we're like, oh, what, what did we talk about? And so I wanted to get into um, some things about like AEC automation, um, kind of where we're at, like what what the technology um, is available now, specifically within Revit, um, and just some of my thoughts about you know what what's coming or what in particular like what use cases I'm starting to see on my end again as as like a automation consultant, um, like things are starting to shift a little bit in the kind of things in projects that I'm doing, um, which I think is, is quite interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And then I'll talk about some, some of those projects. I can't talk about them in super detail, mm -hmm. uh, but we'll get into a little bit. And then I just have a, a little demo. We'll see how much time we have yeah. um, in Dynamo that, that gets at, you know, again, um, these use cases that I'll, that I'll mm -hmm. be talking about. Awesome. And yeah, <laughs> any, any questions at any point? Yeah, no, no. So I'm going to keep an eye on the chat and I'll, I'll interject and, and ask questions yes. and discuss as we go along. I think, I think that's great. I think uh, when, when you when you brought brought up the topic, I think the the idea of, of some use cases and practicality is always or practical. I, I mean, I guess practical, maybe not the best word sometimes, but, <laughs> um, you know, seeing a, a, in a real world example of things is always so beneficial, especially when we're talking about these things that, you know, like, like refinery and, and computational design and stuff that right. I think even when Dynamo first was was introduced, right? I think a lot of people had had, had a hard time, um, you know, grasping the concept as something pragmatic in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So so I think you know the more real world examples that that we talk about or even possible real world examples, I think is helpful for people, right? And, and so I'm hoping that's what we come out of today. And I and I think uh, with that, I think you can start rolling i think you'll you'll probably oh, yeah. uh I mean, sh share your screen i'm, I'm just my screen. yeah checking out the chat and people are uh chit chatting with each other which is great <laughs> no questions yet so uh okay so no oh, perfect there we go um so i just have a mind map um hopefully you can see that yeah and um again we're going to talk about technology and i and i have to say like now is a great time um for if you're curious about like automation or if you you know you're not sure but like now is a great time because there's just some really cool stuff that's happening mm -hmm. you know and and there's a bunch of different ways you can kind of get started with it like i again i tried to learn to program a bunch of times um it was hard it is hard i ended up kind of biting the bullet and just learning to program in Revit, like writing Revit macros. And this was around the time, this was slightly before Dynamo came out. And then like Dynamo came out, I'm like, oh man, like if 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 I had waited or if it had come out a little bit earlier, like that's um, really greatly reduces the, the learning curve. But mm -hmm. in addition, like their Dynamo, and we'll get into that, um, Refinery, you know, Forge and other stuff, like there's just a lot of interesting technology out there. Mm -hmm. um, so you can... Um, you can do a lot more. And what I found, again, I'm like, I'm an architect, I'm not a computer science guy, but like, it is such a deep, you like, you can go in really deep. Yeah. Um, and I find that like, I'm getting further and further uh, into that in the work that I'm doing. And it, there's still like, I can't see the bottom, you know, like, <laughs> I, mean, I probably never will. Right, uh, right, but right. if we start talking about technology, like, obviously, um, I'm going to kind of work through this, like from, from, top down to bottom in terms of, you know, I guess, accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, if, if you are not familiar with any program, haven't done any kind of programming, you know, Dynamo is a great place to start. And I really like it because it's graphic and visual um, and it's fun. Right. Uh, but it also starts getting you thinking about, like, computational concepts. So, like, you're working with lists, you have to use strings, like, you're using integers. Like, you're, you're learning um, computational concepts, even though you may not think you are mm -hmm. um and i and i think that's really the big um one of the fundamentals is just developing that computational mindset and being able to think kind of like a computer does because it's really in a, a an approach to problem solving and um that only helps you sort of further down the road like mm -hmm. again i jumped in i learned vb.net um and text you know text-based programming mm -hmm. um and, and it was just it was harder like to actually make something that was useful yeah and so I, 
<laughs> it was banging my head for a long time. Yeah, well, um, one, one of the things I, I realized when it came to, to Dynamo um, was, you know, I, I did sort of the same thing. You know, Dynamo didn't exist when I first started attempting to automate a couple things, right? And and so I, I tried learning the VB, VB.net, mm-hmm. C, and, and, you know, I kind of got some things to work. But what I found out is once I started learning Dynamo, it actually helped me understand what I was trying oh. to do on the code side more. You yeah, know what absolutely. I mean? It, 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 the yeah. logic comes in in your, you know, it, it's just so much more visual that you can say, yeah. oh, well, that's how an if statement works when I'm writing in C sharp. But you know, the the lot it just all of a sudden made made sense to me. You oh, know? totally, yeah. <laughs> Which was, was yep. great. You know, sort of a side effect. And like Dynamo is the gateway drug towards you know for programming because <laughs> right. like you start and then you yeah you can start to make those associations. Right. right. Um, it was actually harder for me to to go back and like learning Dynamo was, I think, was harder because I had, you know, mm-hmm. a certain understanding of of VB.net and C sharp, and then I had to unlearn that to some extent because dynamo works a little bit different than Mm -hmm. other programming languages but you know there's the common out like they're both built on the the um revit api so like the 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 ground is laid they're working Mm -hmm. off of the same material so it was easy in that regard um but you know i think like a logical progression you know you start with dynamo um things like dynamo and then Dynamo into Python because you can do Python scripts. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Start dabbling there, um, and I think that's a really good kind of progression into that. Now, as far as Dynamo goes, though, like with what's next and what's what's new, like Refinery, um, I'm super curious about. I I haven't come up with a use case for it yet. <laughs> um, I think it's super interesting, and I'm still like, it's on my to do list right. to actually make it do something and. <laughs> We'll get to that a bit when we talk about use cases, because I, I do wonder if Refinery is sort of like either it's ahead of its time or we're just not there yet, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because it's it's you know it's solving big problems, and I'm not sure we're at where you know a lot of the tools that that we need or that we're going to make are big big problem tools. You know, right? Right? Is it, is uh, it right? Is it a tool that exists, or is it a tool that exists for a problem that's not there yet, but will be, you know, that, that's yeah. kind of, yeah, yeah. I, I think so because, mm-hmm. you know, again, I think that the, the industry isn't there yet. Um, mm-hmm. I think that, you know, we're not necessarily, some people may be, you know, developing algorithms to do office layouts or, mm-hmm. you know, thing like, or determine the massing of buildings. Um, but the majority, you know, of us practitioners, like we're, those aren't the problems that we're, right. we're looking at. I mm-hmm. do think that there's some interesting problems though that we could solve, and, oh, and maybe sure. they use refinery, but maybe they don't. So I'm I'm still like I'm skeptical, but interested. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm still trying to. F- I want to play with refinery right. um, to, to see if I can find that you know that that sweet spot. Well, but maybe do- uh, maybe what we should do is uh, we have quite a few people on on in the chat and watching, so maybe um, those of you out there watching us live, since this is live, maybe. Uh, Give us some ideas or examples of if you've messed with refinery or, yeah. or maybe how, what, what problems you can see it solve. Because mm-hmm. um, you know it, it has floated around for a while before it got built right. into Revit, um, yep. and so there's there's always been the thought of it, and you know, and, and Hypar has been floating around. So you know, there, there's been tools yep. around that that can do this, but um, and also you know, Grasshopper, Rhino, that whole thing, you know, for computational design. So there, there's there's been tools, but I am curious to see the the most practical, you know, high percentage usage, right? Because like you said. Um, it's the same with a lot of things, you know, when you look at uh, these, these high end, so to speak, technologies, um, you know, what percentage of the AEC industry right. is, is, mm-hmm. is, you know, is, is that helping, right? Because some people are still just trying to figure out how to make a template Revit. And so, yeah. you know, if, yeah. if, you, if that's where you are still, then, then you're not thinking about how can I computationally design my, my living room or something, you know, so yeah. I would love to hear, you know, maybe as, as you're going on, maybe you guys in the chat there, you know, give us, give us some ideas. So now with and I, and I think like the Dynamo ecosystem is is going to be interesting to see how that evolves. And I, mm-hmm. I'm encouraged that Autodesk is starting to port it over, you know, the Civil 3D and mm-hmm. Maya. And again, I'm hoping someday they do an AutoCAD version because <laughs> AutoCAD is not going away as far as I can. But you know, I think that 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 will be you know its own ecosystem, particularly as they develop um, and iterate with Refinery. So mm-hmm. um, that's going to be watch now another area like in technology that i that i think is interesting and i hear more and more um people that are using pi revit but are customizing it so they're mm. you know pi revit is a, is a python based um 
free set of tools in Revit, but it's also its own sort of um, ecosystem itself. So mm -hmm. I know of a few firms that have, they, you know, they run PyRevit, like that is one of their standard add-ins, but they also have used it to build their own tools. Mm -hmm. um, the benefit there is that you can, you can write, you know, a Python script um, that uses the Revit API and, you know, you can write it using regular Python development tools, um, but you don't have to build all the infrastructure that, you know, adds buttons and, and connects it to like the, to the ribbon, like mm -hmm. PyRevit will take care of a lot of that. Right. For, right. So you can kind of like drop a Python script into a folder and all of a sudden it appears on, on your ribbon. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, the overhead that's required to kind of, you know, build an add in and then, mm -hmm. you know, deploy it, you can handle that a lot more easily. Yeah. Um, and it's a lot more nimble. Than, but you still, you're kind of like, you're not using, you know, Dynamo, you're not using Dynamo Player. Um, it's a little bit more towards an add in, but it's not the full commitment to the add in. So I think mm -hmm. that that, like, PyRevit is, is kind of an interesting platform, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it, I, I haven't really played with that too much, other than I know, again, of firms that have, that's their standard. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and that is a good point. I think the, I always found one of the hardest parts to get started in, in add in development or, or with Revit was just getting the, you know, visual, visual studio to, to yes. connect and, and, and yeah. do what you want with Revit. Right. I mean, so oh, totally. PyRevit yeah. kind of takes that, that, that one roadblock out of the way, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like I started with Revit macros, the, you know, the next piece of technology on our list here. And, and largely that was because I didn't want to have to like, it was enough to learn how to code and, and be able to write code that did something. Mm -hmm. And that was a good, that was a good step because the overhead required to use Visual Studio and build it as an add-in, like that was too much for me when I started. It was, right. mm -hmm. that was going to take me another three months to figure out. Right, like I right. want to make something right now mm -hmm. that actually mm -hmm. would work. Um, so I, I worked in macros for a long time and just, you know, that, that was good. And then at some point I knew I needed to, to make that leap um, right. and then start using Visual Studio. So macros use, uh, Revit has a built-in um, like a code envir coding environment. Mm -hmm. um, it's called Sharp Develop and it's built into Revit. So that's, you know, you can write a macro, um, you can write it inside of Revit and then it embeds the macro code into your RVT file. Mm -hmm. um, and so like I built, you know, I have a RVT file that has like 20, 25 macros or so in it. So I mm -hmm. kind of built out a tool set or, a, you know, a toolbox with that. And that, that worked great. Um, the downside of macros is that you have to have that file, that RVT file open if you mm -hmm. want to run any of the macros. Uh, and there are ways you can embed, you can do uh, application macros that are embedded in your instant, like your Revit installation, um, but then only you can use them or you can have document macros that are in actually in the RVT file. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're good because you, know, you don't need any additional software. Um, they actually take away a lot of the complexity because you don't have to create the connection from you know, from your, your programming tool into Revit. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some limitations to that as well. Um, but like for me, that was my, my stepping stone. So I went, you know, I'm going to learn to code. I'm going to learn, you know, how to write macros and I can do it right inside of Revit. Yeah. Um, but then you hit that point where it's like, well, I want to do it. Like, you know, I want it to be more convenient. I want it to be, I want an add in, like mm -hmm. I want to have it in Ribbon. Um, <laughs> it, so it's sort of a jump in complexity. So, mm -hmm. That's where you can um, you need to develop those using a standalone uh, development environment. So Visual Studio by Microsoft is the one that's typically used. Um, there's free versions, and it's actually uh, it's really robust. It's really good. But you know, it's a, it's learning a whole another piece of software just so you can kind of write these tools. Um, but I have found you know recently in the last couple of years now. Uh, for a long time, I would start as a macro, and then it, I would convert the macro over to an add-in through Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. And right now, it's like I'll just go straight to Visual Studio. Like I've gotten um, a lot more comfortable. You don't need the training wheels. <laughs> I don't need the training wheels. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, and again, that's like a progression. And I think all mm -hmm. of this, you know, and all of us have this level. Like, where, where is, where do I want to stop, or what, what's good enough for me? Like, do I, you know, for me, I, I said, well, I want to get more deeper into automation so like i'm sort of going down that path doing less and less architecture um, right. for a lot of people like dynamo is is sufficient because it it gives you and it gets you you know well versed in the in sort of the language uh mm -hmm. in the concepts um, right right 
but yeah, with add-ins, you know, it's again, uh, Dynamo and add-ins are all built on the same Revit API. And the Revit API, just like a new release of Revit comes out, like when they release Revit 2021, like I'll scour through the release notes and I'll see what they've added mm -hmm. in the API because they release certain things. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still limitations. Like you can't, I'm, I've got to double check this because it, it's still a head scratcher, but you can't create ceilings through the Revit API. Like <laughs> I, I can't believe that, but it's true. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it's, and there it's are whatever, things. yeah, yeah. But when you use the API, you're you're limited to what what the they have decided. The API has created, yes. right, right, yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. you can do a lot. Like right. that's that's kind of the the cool thing. But there's every so often you hit a point where you're like, you know, can't do it. <laughs> there's no way. Or I'll get a request like, oh, I want to do this, and it's like, sorry, you know, there's no, this is not possible to do mm -hmm. it. Um, so the the next sort of evolution of that is the Forge platform. Um, and you've probably, like, if you've gone to AU at all in the last five years, you've heard about Forge. Um, and it, but it's often sort of not clear exactly what it is and, and what it does. Um, and basically, like, Forge is a, is a web API. So you can use um, portions of Autodesk software through the web. Um, and, you know, and it, it's super interesting uh, in that regard. And it's a whole another level of complexity to it. Uh, and I've started dabbling with it, but I'm, I'm, I'm not there yet. I'm not even close to being there yet. Uh, it, again, like it's on my list, like refinery. And, and this list has been going on for a couple of years, but like <laughs> forge or refinery, like I'm going to dive into these. But the idea being that like you can do certain processes um, on the cloud mm -hmm. and certain Revit processes on the cloud. And, um, you know, and that, that, gets kind of interesting um, there's a lot that you could do you could have like you could you know run revit or do revit processes through a website mm -hmm. uh, so you could think about like content providers you know people that anderson windows Palo window like those you know who are doing building content they can use uh forge to kind of create custom families on the fly and then you know you can download them things things of that nature mm -hmm. so you can build really a robust um, web applications that make use of Autodesk products as an engine in the background um, and then, you know, spit something out and that all happens through a browser. It could also happen, you know, through, through a button in, you know, in the ribbon in Revit, like Revit itself uses some of those like cloud rendering, um, like insight, like they all make use of Autodesk's um, cloud-based resources in that regard. Yeah. Now, what I think is when I've looked at it, because uh, I have an idea of something I want to do. Like I want to be able, I have a, a macro that I've written that does, um, that will convert AutoCAD drawings into Revit lines. Mm -hmm. um, and that works out really well. Where it gets tricky is if you want to convert text, you know, text hatches, dimensions, those sorts of things. Because right. the, the Revit API won't do that conversion. Um, so I've written a, a custom tool that does it, but it requires you to run a tool in, in AutoCAD yeah. that exports your text out to a CSV file mm -hmm. and then I read the CSV file in Revit yeah. and it's like, it's, it works sort of, but it's just not, it's not great. Mm -hmm. uh, but like using Forge in theory, you could, you know, take that AutoCAD, that DWG file and you could read it in Forge, extract, you know, your text, your dimensions, your hatch, mm -hmm. um, and then bring that, pull that down into AutoCAD, uh, sorry, into Revit and do the conversion. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't even need, um, to have AutoCAD installed to be able to do that process. Right. Um, so mm -hmm. that's like, I'm like, oh, I need to do this. Uh, you know, and then I tried it. And I'm like, wow, man, this is really hard. Uh, <laughs> partly because, again, you're dealing with web APIs. So it's a like, different, it's a different uh, playground. <laughs> it's a different playground. And you have to actually, like, authenticate. Like, mm -hmm. so, you know, I have to, in my program, I add in or whatever, I have to tell Forge, like, who I am. Mm -hmm. um, Forge charges you. And that's kind of interesting. So every time you run like a, a an application on Forge, mm -hmm. they're going to charge you, you know, you the developer for it. Mm -hmm. um, so you have so many credits, and then you have to, you know, develop going back. So like the security, uh, the complexity of like the handshakes between all the pieces uh, gets a little bit tricky in that regard. So again, I think it's like it's really powerful. It's super useful. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have some ideas. I just haven't actually figured out how to do it yet. Uh, so, we'll, you know, we'll see, hopefully that will change, but I, I, you know, certainly can see the, the potential for it. Right. Um, 
it's just you know getting to that point where I can do something useful. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, sort of the next, I think it's the next step beyond that is something like Hypar. Um, and and for me, I, I'm still not exactly sure what it is. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, I've sat through a lot of presentations, um, and I I think it's you know it's that next thing. It's that next next thing. Like it's basically a you know to some extent it's a it's an API, but it's not software based it's sort of building and component based um you know and there's obviously some really smart people working on it and i just can't quite get my head around it um, what, what yeah what what it what the connection is and and, and you know I, i'm you know my understanding is that it's similar to to refinery and how it you know it, it utilizes generative yeah yeah, yeah. but but to your point i don't want to pretend like i uh I'm nearly as smart as Ian or those crew, and, and, yeah, I'm like, and I have, try to I try no to. Be... What you guys are doing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, there's some huge potential there. I've seen some some case some 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 examples of what what it can do, and right. and, yep. and, I, and I can see the light at the end of the tunnel as to where where the value is going to be there for sure. Yeah, because I think what's interesting is then you know you start thinking about encoding a design or like a design logic and and we'll talk about that a little bit more because again that's where i see things heading sort of very slowly but we're, we're getting that way where you know you're starting to develop systems and you're developing processes mm -hmm. and those the the artifact like the building or the component or whatever that is a an output mm -hmm. as opposed to the thing itself right, um, right. And i think that's super interesting because then you can you know you think about you can license, you know, if you have software you've written that can develop a building, you know, with certain specifications or certain, you know, a certain style, um, that's something that can then be licensed. You can license that collection of algorithms and code. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's a whole different animal. Like that's a, that's a different profession. Yeah. That's a different job. Um, so I think it's interesting to speculate, you know, who knows if, we'll, if things will get to that point. Yeah. Um, but you know, like I read a lot of sci-fi, and I can, I'm like, yeah, I can see that. That's like, <laughs> right. you know, cars will fly uh, one day, right? <laughs> cars, yeah, totally. So, <laughs> I mean, well, you know, the, obviously the jury is out. We'll mm -hmm. see if it gets there. But, um, you know, so I, I think the vision of that is interesting. I think though, if we dial it back and let's jump into um, use cases, if we think about, you know, where, how we're going to use automation and where we're going to take it, like what we're doing now, a lot of a lot of what I see in Dynamo, a lot of the stuff that I've written uh, is really about task automation. Mm -hmm. You know, like I don't want to click the button a hundred times. I'd rather have Revit do it for me. And right. so, you know, creating sheets, like things of that nature um, that you're just going to be doing repetitive tasks, you know, mm -hmm. um, Dynamo macros, add-ins, like they're great for doing that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really sort of like the first, you know, a lot of the first stuff that we we try to tackle because um, you can make huge time saving with that like you know you can write i can write a program i can write an add-in in an hour or so and i'm going to use it like if you do the math it saves me you know 30 seconds i run it two times a day and like that it compounds on itself so that hour i spent you know it's now suddenly saving me you know, hundreds of hours. So like mm -hmm. the math is really in your favor in that regard. Um, so task automation though, to a certain point, um, even like Dynamo, we can create even our own custom tools that will automate tasks that are particular mm -hmm. to us or tasks to the, the work we're doing. Um, and we can do it pretty, pretty quickly. And I think that's again, great. Like Dynamo has turned a lot of us into tool makers. Um, so we can really make our own tools. Uh, the other use case obviously is data and, and being able to um, take stuff. And this is like my favorite. I love doing this in Dynamo. Anytime I can dump anything to Excel, uh, <laughs> that's like makes me so happy because um, I can take it you know, from Revit into Excel and I can transform it and I can suck it back in. And I think that that alone you know, is worth learning Dynamo. Mm -hmm. for just because I can, you know, I can customize, I can get exactly what parameter I want. I can transform that parameter. Mm -hmm. I can do a lot. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that obviously is, is a huge use case. And I'm starting to see too, even, even inside of Revit, like I'm beta testing somebody else's tool right now that um, does some really interesting stuff on the data side. Um, and it kind of like, you know, it's like stuff that Revit should do, but doesn't. Um, so it's exciting to be able to see that. Um, and hopefully in you know, in a few weeks, I'll be able to share more, at least sort of my experimentations with, um, with this tool. But it's like, 
it's like, all right, now we're, you know, now we're getting there. So I think that the data piece will always be there um, because there's a lot of value that we're putting into the models Mm -hmm. that we want to be able to extract and and share and distribute and so forth. Um, And then one of of the areas that I've been um, um, focused on in the past few months, big time is, uh, is working with Power BI and and sort of creating, Mm -hmm. you know, creating data visuals from, from models and, and yeah. You know, being able to manipulate the data is, is massive. And so we've, you know, there's always some sort of a Dynamo script involved sometimes yep. you know, to, to pull things out, pull things in, you know, push parameters from different locations and stuff. And, you know, I do plan on sometime in the future doing doing one of these happy hours on uh, on Power BI because I don't think it's talked about enough yet. But I think there is um, some massive, massive uh, value to be added there. So, oh, totally. Especially yeah, when, and I can see. when it comes to the data. Yeah. You know, for you, Jeff, too, like in a construction firm like the mm-hmm. data the model you know the data that you're putting into the model um mm-hmm. has real world ramifications and real world uses like mm-hmm. i can see that that's a, a really great tool that expands you know mm-hmm. the, the value of bim beyond yeah. just the model the drawings and all that so that's really cool exactly, um, yeah. yeah i love data i'm like i'm <laughs> uh you know and i think this is always i've heard this like if you ask somebody what's their favorite part of, of revit and and yeah I'm always like, it's schedules. I love schedules, you know, so. Do you know um, what's in my model? Do you know, know. what's actually there? <laughs> it's not that pretty so pictures. That's so me. It's like, <laughs> I can do schedule? Oh, I love um, so be- um, before we move on a little bit, I was just following the chat along, and there was a couple of questions um, that I think we could probably answer on the fly that, that, are, that are related. Um, and so um, Junior was asking about refinery. Is it is it uh, accessible in twenty Revit 2020, or how do you get it? And I think the answer... I, I believe the answer is it's it's only in 2021. 2021, yeah. I have I think, 20. If I remember correctly, yeah, it I was don't. it was um, pre 2021. I do believe it was a web app that you had to yeah upload models to. So it it did exist and it does yeah. exist, but um right yeah, yeah so. and I think you can still do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but in in 2021 they added it, you know, like they did a couple versions ago with Dynamo. They added it to the ribbon. Um, so yeah, I think you can. And I ha- again, I don't know the mechanics of it other than I think that it provides you, you know, a similar interface that you get through the web, mm-hmm. but you're doing it inside of Revit. Right, um, right, right. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then um, a couple other, you know, I think a lot of people are agreeing with you as far as task automation. Um, BIM Lounge, I'm sorry, I'm not sure who that is, but that's your username, <laughs> said that uh, one, of, one of the biggest benefits that they're seeing is... Um, on project setup, which is what you're talking about. Oh, there, which yeah, is, absolutely. You know, yep. uh, sheet creation, view placement, you know, all the general projects. I mean, that was that was what got me into Dynamo was. Oh, totally. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, you know <laughs> having going through the process of duplicating views and creating part plans. Right. Yep. And, and if anyone's ever uh, done that, which I'm sure everyone oh, out there has done that, you know, right. That that is the process where you're like, why on earth do I have to do this? manually? <laughs> Especially when you, I mean, I think the first time I did it was on a school that had like, you know, part up to part z or or, or, oh. or y and it was just some stupid really really big school and so plus you know reflected ceiling plans and all that stuff so you're doing this yeah. thing i mean how many times are you duplicating these views <laughs> you know and there's always that like project architect and i i i've run into this and like you do it all and they're like you know i've been looking at this and i'd like to do it this way and you're like Mm-hmm. seriously um there's always gonna be someone who's not convinced there's always gonna be. oh yeah i mean but, we, well, we do we do so auto- much so much sorry i'm sorry the b uh no, we we do a ton of model-based takeoff and there's always yep. there's always the one guy who just doesn't trust it and believe it uh, and, yeah yeah and yeah even though even though he has the data he still goes back and does a manual takeoff. I was like, huh, uh, look at that. It's the same. <laughs> or it's, right. you know, it's close within, you know, two Yeah, percent. and you'll never <laughs> you probably, I mean, maybe at some point. Like and once yeah. you win that person over, like they're sold. Right. They're gonna be your best, you know, your yeah. best champion. Exactly. Um, but until then they're probably gonna just ride you and say, like, it's not as good, it's not as good. Um, right. that's funny. Uh, so as far other use cases like simulation, and I think you know, we can we can do that obviously through some tool you know like insight and so on and so forth but we can also develop our own probably to a lesser degree you know kind of simulation tools and Mm -hmm. i've seen some really interesting stuff i haven't written any tools that will do daylighting simulation or anything but i've seen some um and and there's some you know there's a lot of math involved in that (laughs) but like looking at like daylighting and doing daylighting calcs Mm -hmm. uh, um there you know again there's some really 
great stuff that you can do and develop. Um, but what I'm starting to see more of, and I think I'd say in the last like year, year and a half, um, is more on the design side. And um, and specifically looking at like design patterns, design system, and then design automation. And this kind of like a progression, mm-hmm. you know, design pattern would be to you know, like a facade pattern, being able to generate something, you know, iterations of a facade pattern. Mm-hmm. Um, a design system is something, you know, that's a little bit more robust and then we can uh, create, you know, like th- for a design system, this is this is on my list, but like, you know, laying out toilet rooms. Nobody wants to lay out a toilet room. Right. And, and realistically, like that's pretty much, it's pretty rule-based. So mm-hmm. like w- it should be able to be computed. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you had a tool that could, you know, optimize your space or tell you exactly what you need for, you know, to accommodate, you know, however many people like that's something that I think has a lot of value. Mm -hmm. Uh, And again, it's, you're going to be doing it in every project. So it's not something that's like refinery where you're creating all these iterations of a skyscraper based on your, you know, your FAR or like local zoning, but it's a, you know, it is a design tool that could again provide um, a lot of value. Could be very specific to the way you, like your firm wants mm-hmm. to do things, um, and but you're going to be using it over and over again. Um, and also getting into design automation, you know, like if you're looking at um, certain features, like uh, I'll talk about some of the pro- a couple projects that I'm working on right now um, that are you know moving more in that direction. And I think part of that is due to um, like. The design automation stuff, or sorry, the task automation stuff has been sort of figured out, or depending on where you are. Um, but for some firms, like they've they've built out like their tool set, and they kind of know how they they're going to handle a lot of that task automation. And so the next order of business is getting into design related things, and mm-hmm. design related things are a lot fuzzier. So it's you know um, you're going to be looking at either different options or different iterations, or you're going to be you know trying to figure out how to structure a design problem in such a way that it can be computed. So it's a, another order of magnitude in terms of the complexity. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it, it's, there's some interesting problems to solve there. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm working on, I'll, I'll talk about them in general terms because it, um, you know, I can't, I'd love to show you this stuff, um, but we're not there yet. Mm-hmm. Meaning that, it's still proprietary. So I have um, two projects that I'm working on now. One is with a residential developer and they are developing like a semi-custom, um, I want a residential building system. Mm-hmm. And so uh, they have kind of like a, a series of components that can then be assembled, you know, into a, a custom home. Um, and with that, like we're working through and trying to figure out and make it as systematic as possible. So we're, we're starting at it, not necessarily from a design perspective, but we're looking at like, what are all the options? What are the iterations? Uh, what are the different facade options and how can we build a system so that we can very quickly assemble, you know, a, a house? Because mm-hmm. um, we're going to have to go through entitlement. We're going to have to go, you know, through permitting. We're going to have to go um, then ultimately to construction. And so they're kind of like end to end. So there's um, a real estate agents on board, there's a contractor on board. Um, And so we're trying to streamline that whole process. Mm -hmm. Uh, But a lot of that is really, you know, looking at it very systematically. And so um, we're getting to the point, there's a client signed on, like almost like money has not been exchanged, but I've heard, you know, checks will be written so we'll see you know when that happens but when it does like that time frame is very short so how quickly can we um, develop a system so we can deliver documents to produce a house very quickly mm-hmm. um, so you know with that the idea there too is it's a design related um, you know we're, we're developing you know a, a design system as opposed to you know developing or designing a building Mm -hmm. so ultimately it's going to be a um you know very much a a series of tools that we're putting together so So that's kind of fun yes so so you're kind of i mean when you think about it that way you're you're kind of stripping down or breaking down what would be your your manual design process as an architect and you're trying yeah how do you how do you you know it's almost like you're looking at yourself how do you systematically make decisions through the design process to get right. from A to B um, yeah. and, and then what, what, what gets put in place in between and how can you make that, you know, streamline that system? 
Yeah. And, you know, I think that realistically, like I'm, the vision is that we can, you know, we can press a button and then it's done. And like, realistically, that's not going to happen. And it's probably going to be, we're going <laughs> to sort of cobble a bunch of things together. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the, the, you know, the intent is that we're going to build a system that we can iterate. Mm-hmm. And for each, you know, each version, each house that gets produced, that system gets a little bit better. But it's a, a you know, obviously a very different way to think about mm-hmm things um so for you know for me as sort of an automation guy like that's a that's kind of a interesting problem to tackle um because we can really start to look at the whole process you know we're using revit so we're going to be figuring out how to to assemble like a a set of drawings um in such a way you know that that is going to be repeatable Mm -hmm. Uh, but but again that it's really much more of a design system so uh, you know we're we're not designing buildings but we're building design systems really <laughs> um and i've i've had other inquiries and again in, in a span of like i'd say in the last two years um these two other projects didn't come up but it was like hey one of them was you know looking at how can we start to develop a system specifically for you know building components in this case they did you know we were going to start looking at a, a restroom design tool like we want to build this and, and automate that process and mm-hmm. another project was looking at um, they were going to be rolling out restaurants like uh, these were kind of quick serve restaurants so you would order ahead on an app mm-hmm. and then you'd go in and pick it up um, and so the rollout plan was was really ambitious so the idea was like okay how can we start to automate the design and layout of these restaurants because we're going to be doing we got to turn them around in like a couple of days mm-hmm. um, so, you know, I, it was interesting to see those in a short span of time, um, projects of a very similar nature start to come in. Um, so another project that I'm working on um, is with an engineering firm. They're a large engineering firm, and I'm developing a tool for them that's it's kind of like a model, a model populator. And so we are doing, you know, design to a certain level um, with you know, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems um, mm-hmm. where we're sort of working room by room and we're populating the model with those elements. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we're, you know, using rule-based kind of logic to determine, you know, how many diffusers do you need? What's your lighting layout? Uh, and that sort of thing. So that's, um, that's super interesting because, again, that can shave off a whole lot of time, but it can also standardize the way they're doing a lot of their operations. Mm-hmm. So, it's, you know, it's, it's still design. Um, and you still need sort of an engineering knowledge, but we can sort of front load a lot of that work um, into the model, so you're not placing individual instances. Yeah, uh, yeah. That that to me, when, when you know, on both the the design side and on the, the construction side, to me, the the MEP side of of our industry is an area where these these automated tools and, and computational you know because it's just it's so rule-based and, and yeah it is and, and, yep. and just you know it, it's the the problem itself you know with obviously there's exceptions and this isn't to demean the mep side of things but you know the, the problem itself is getting from point a to point b and and you know not hitting other things fitting in a certain space like it's just it's such a a a a a problem and solution sort of thing that like, mm-hmm. it, it's it almost seems like a no-brainer to you know let's 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 automate the routing first or the pop like you said the population and then you know the engineer can go in and and, and you know use human brain to, to right. you know to check and, and and do the actual you know that part of it but you know the 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 initial run i mean you know of course on the contractor side dealing with coordination and clash detection all the time um, you know, it's, it's, to me, you look at it and it's like, well, <laughs> you've got a space, you've got a void and you need to fit these seven things in it. Like yeah, there's only so exactly many right. ways you can do that. Right. <laughs> and, it's, and so a computer can figure out those 700 ways that you can fit them in that space. And then you decide which one is the best way. Or which whatever, one is right? the best. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think, and that's where I think like refinery comes in mm-hmm. as a, an iterative tool that will do that. So you define the rules and then, then you basically use refinery as an engine to crank out all of those permutations. Um, And so I do, I think that there's, there are some really, there are going to be some interesting things that come out of it. I don't think they're going to be, you know, skyscrapers and like (laughs) figuring out zoning, but those are the fun things. Like I think from a marketing perspective, like, Oh, if we can do a building, it can figure out a toilet room. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I, I think that there will be like that, that part of it 
just being able to quickly generate those mm -hmm. or, you know, a certain number of options anyways, um, yeah. is going to be really useful. Mm -hmm. So that's where I, I do think too, like we're, we're sort of moving in that trajectory of these design tools, um, that will allow us to, you know, design more, design better, like design faster. Um, yeah. and we, we have the ability to create our tools too, so we can kind of customize them the way, you know, the way that we want them. Yep. Definitely. Definitely. Um, well, I look forward to those two works in progress. Uh, maybe when, yeah, when, when they become when they become yeah. part of the demo in the next piece then you can come on again and you can show us <laughs> yeah so i did have a demo like i wanted to i we have what do we have, we, we we have, have some time. Yeah, go, yeah okay definitely, definitely. um so i wanted to do just a quick like concept sort of run through in dynamo like how you can at least start thinking about these things um in particular like looking at design patterns so um, you know, if we were to look at like, how could you pattern a, a series of elements, you, you know, in and out, like in another element inside of, of Revit. And we'll look at particularly like a facade pattern. Um, but you, again, you could think about restrooms. How could you apply this to apartment layouts, like consistent things that need to, to come together. Um, and I'm working uh, with Autodesk on some courses, particularly um, their customer success learning hub. Let me see if I can, I can pull it up real quick um so they have this whole series of um short courses they're like 15 minute courses mm -hmm. so i've done one uh for dynamo and i'm doing two more and I, i'm going to focus particularly on on this idea of like patterns and using dynamo more as a design tool and, and looking at different ways that we can do that so i'll give you a little a little taste of that um right Perfect. now yeah. sort of run run through that um but I think this, again, it's kind of, you know, fun stuff inside of um, Revit to start looking at and, and kind of expand Dynamo a little bit beyond, um, you know, the task automation. Right. Cool. And, and again, you know, there's so much that you can do with Dynamo. So it's a lot of fun. Um, let me pull up. All right. Hold on one second. I'm going to just pull up Dynamo. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. You can see my battery. Low. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know what happened? Like, it's funny. I lost, I lost my power supply for my lap somehow in traveling around. I lost my power supply. Okay. So I bought like a third party power supply. It doesn't um, quite fit. It, it, it's not the right, like, it's not, I don't know. I didn't get the right wattage or whatever. So it, um, I just realized I get that warning and then I just have to unplug it and plug it back in. And it like sustains me at like 3%. Oh, well, um, that, that sounds yeah. risky, risky, man. That it, sounds risky. No, it, it's totally risky. And it's like the first time it happened, I'm like, no. <laughs> um, so anyways, if we've got, yeah, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I was going to sort of build this um, from scratch, but I'll open it up. Um, I'll show you the, the finished product and then I'll kind of walk you through it. So what I'm going to do inside of Revit here, well, let's see if I can do a split screen. And Okay, so I'm just going to draw a wall. Um, let's do this real quick. Okay, so we'll make it that big and I'll switch to a 3D view. Uh, so it's just a little bit more fun to look at. And I think, yeah, I can close properties. Okay. So um, what this script does, let me pull this guy over. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to select my wall in the model. Um, and you can see here, it, what it's doing is it's just generating a repeating window pattern. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, and is, you know, would you ever, you know, use Dynamo? Maybe, maybe not to kind of do this. But what I, what I like about this example is it starts to show like how you can define a pattern inside of Dynamo and then use it, you know, to do other things, other useful things. Right. Um, so I think it's a, it's a good starting point to start talking about like being able to generate, you know, geometry in Dynamo um, and then and use that to do stuff that can have sort of a design perspective. So mm -hmm. things, you know, points along a line, grids, those sorts of things can be super useful um, as a starting point to do, you know, other kind of design related tools. So what what this does, and let me just switch, I'll switch to it uh, full screen and walk you through it in, in the time that we have. Um, but essentially what we're doing is we're getting our wall. Um, we're getting its location and it's, it's a wall. So its location is a line. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then we get the start point. So that's where we're going to use as our, our beginning point. And in parallel to that, what I'm doing here is I'm just defining a pattern. So a pattern, you know, I can do this any way I want. I'm using letters. Mm -hmm. So what I have is a, a pattern that goes ABC and then it repeats ABC, 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 and on and on and on. So that's kind of giving me my, my rhythm of the windows um, and then from that pattern i use that to determine the different families the window families that i'm going to insert mm -hmm. um, so this is one of my favorite i love the switch node um, what is that that's in uh let me see i forget what package that's in it's in clockwork yeah okay. so um and if you've if you've done any programming, like switch nodes are great in programming because <clears throat> I can say, you know, if this value is this, excuse me one second. <clears throat> if the value is A, use this family. If the value is B, use this. If the yeah. value is C, use this other thing. So it's great. Um, and I could, you know, if I added D or C, I could, you know, just build on and on mm -hmm. to this. Um, so that's creating, you know, my, I've created my, my repetitive pattern here. Um, and then I have my windows that match up to, you know, A, B, or C. And then I'm going to use that next to create my point sequence. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is I've generated, you know, I know where my start point is. Um, I know how many, here I have uh, 30, I have 30 letters in my sequence. Mm -hmm. And then I, I can define my spacing mm -hmm. um, right here. So right now my spacing is at five and a half feet. Um, and I can change that with the number slider. And then what I'm going to do is just, I'm going to create, um, I'm going to repeat that. So I have five and a half. So each spacing from window to window is five and a half. Mm -hmm. um, under here, I'm going to add, I'm just getting a count. So I'm getting a count one, two, three, up to 30. Um, and then I'm, all I'm doing here is I'm basically adding. So I'm creating, uh, I'm adding my list of numbers together. So the first one is at five and a half, then 11, 16 and a half, 22. So this is my, my spacing um, as I go. So if I were to change this to just five, we'd see that, oh, let's hit turn there, um, delete instance. So now my, my number spacing is five, 10, 15, 20. And what I'm doing is I'm just creating a series of points. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm creating, you know, from point one to point two to point three, here is my spacing along the axis. Mm -hmm. um, and then I can use that. Uh, to create the sequence. So I have my start point. I got that from my wall. And and I have a typo in sequence because I was <laughs> typing it very quickly. But uh, all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my start point and I'm going to add uh, five to the X coordinate. And so I'm creating a series of points um, here. So the, And these are going to be my insertion points. Yep. And if we look at them, I have five, 10, 15, 20, you know, on down the line and that they're all based off of the original wall that I created. So I'm using that, the starting point for that wall. And then I'm building onto that to create these various insertion points. Um, and again, I'm, I started with a letter sequence, A, B, and C, and then I'm, I'm using that to generate these points. Mm -hmm. And lastly here, I just insert them. So I tick, I have my wall that I selected. I have my list of insertion points. I have my list of family types here. Um, and then I plug them all in, and that gets me my my window pattern right cool. here. So, you know, if I were to, I can kind of stretch my wallet. It's not necessarily going to change because the spacing is consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, but I could, if I want to start kind of playing around with this a little bit, um, let's say I want to add uh, another element. Let, I'm doing this on the fly. We'll see if it actually works. <laughs> so let's say, with a computer that's dying, possibly. Oh, yeah, yeah, I have, I have. Three percent. No, it'll hold. It'll actually hold that. Like for the rest of yeah, it'll hold it for another week. I'll be at like five percent for the rest of the week. Um, so I'm gonna add that. So let's add a, a fourth window, and we'll pick a different type here. Um, let's do a double hung just to mix it up a little bit. Um, but again, I'm just keeping adding that into the pattern, and so now. Actually, I didn't even really have to do anything. There you go. Uh, where are we? Yeah, let me delete. <laughs> I can see them hanging out there. So I've got that addition of the type. I've got our switch. Yeah, so let's delete this. I'm going to change this to manual. 
Uh, I love I love with, it with, with automatic on. Yeah, you're really asking. Yeah, for I know. <laughs> <laughs> I love automatic, but every so often, you know, it really burns you. Uh, yeah, so here we go. A, B, C, D. A, B, C, D. Mm-hmm. And I can, you know, start monkeying around with my um, my spacing here. So let's say we want to make it a little bit bigger. Space those out. But, you know, again, I, I've created a series of rules. Is this, you know, a super useful? Um, maybe not, but I think it's it's indicative of a way, you know, a way that I can start thinking about this. So if I did need to pattern you know a large uh, a large facade or you know anything like that i could develop a system like this so now i can iterate through it actually pretty quickly and let's say you know let's let's see if I, we break it or not um i'm going to add another item here let's add d and then we'll double up uh, so we'll go a b b c d um that's cool. And let's give it a run. Oh, and I totally broke it. <laughs> <laughs> Figure it. Here we go. We knew something was uh, going to happen. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. So I think awesome. I, I, oh, yeah. I, I totally wrecked it. Um, <laughs> That's okay. So let, me, let me back that out. We get the point. We yeah. know. Anyone who anyone out there who's who's tried demoing Dynamo, oh, Dynamo yeah. Live knows, knows the pain. Yeah. Totally. Um, I awesome. think I have an unequal number. But again, you know, the, the idea being that, like, you know, creating a, a system like this that I'm, I'm, I can use it in an infinite number of different ways. I, what I've done is I've defined, you know, a certain kind of logic um, and I can start to build on that and, and play with it. So now I, I have a tool that will automate, you know, a particular design feature. Um, and again, I do think that this is where we're, you know, things are starting to move within automation because, Task automation is a great place to start, but as you know, the next step beyond that is getting into these kind of custom tools that you know, are design related, can be specific to the firm and the type of the work that the firm does and their kind of design language. Mm-hmm. Um, but also that can also translate to to engineering and other disciplines. Yeah. So um, I think you know it's 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 pretty interesting to see how these all kind of yeah no shape I, out. I I think that's a cool example. I think sh- showing it um, you know. Placing components via via a pattern is, is a unique example. You're used to seeing you know patterns being explained a little differently, and so I, I think that's a cool way to. And once you see something like this, I think your mind can start going to to other places. You know, of what what right. else can you, what exactly. else can you yeah. place that's using these rules within a pattern? You know, and yep. and and, and uh, you know, I mean, I was thinking when you first did it, I, I was I was sitting there thinking, you know, I get a ton of questions about. Um, you know, what if I wanted to place a bunch of bricks manually in Revit? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and so, so you know, your, yeah, mind, totally. your mind automatically starts thinking about, you know, maybe use curtain walls with patterns. But, you know, if, if you really wanted to brute force it and make an extremely difficult to use model, then you, yeah. know, you, <laughs> then you could do something like this where you can easily create a brick pattern and just have a, a, a brick family that gets placed every yes. you know, X amount of feet and stuff. So it's kind of cool. Well, it's funny you mentioned that too, because I got a request from somebody and they're like, hey, we, you know, I, I'm down in Brazil and in Brazil we model CMU and we model each individual mm-hmm. brick. Mm-hmm. I was like, whoa, that's crazy. And he's like, you know, do you have any tools that, that could do it? I'm like, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, really there's, I've, seen, I've worked with some precasters um, and, you know, they're they're clearly trying to figure out the best way to do it and i most of the models i get are copy paste generic models and yeah and it looks it's it's tough <laughs> yeah all right so so maybe uh, if you want to uh stop sharing your screen i'll um yes. we can okay. chit chat uh there's a few questions and a few few things going on in the chat that maybe we could uh <clears throat> we could address before we wrap up um there, it's gotten darker. Here. I know it's, it's like, like you look around. Me. It's like, oh my goodness! Turn the dark. lights off. Yeah. <laughs> um, sweet. So there was a, a few a few questions running around. Um, one of the things um, the BIM coordinator again, thanks for joining us, um, said or asked with all the data we generate um, and and can learn from, do you see machine learning playing a big role now or in the future? Mm. Yes, although I don't know. I'll be honest. Like I know nothing <laughs> about machine learning. Mm. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I think that like the data set, if you think about it, like a, a BIM as a data set, it's mm-hmm. a lot smaller than you would typically see that, you know, machine learning operates on because they're, they're operating on these massive data sets. Yeah. Um, and I, but I do think 
obviously there's some opportunities there. Um, I don't know what they are because uh, mm-hmm. I'm just not. I, I went to at, at built was it last year or two years ago? There was one session on machine learning, and somebody who was really into it um, gave it a talk about like some of the work that they've done with machine learning. And you know, I I consider myself pretty tech savvy, and it was like completely over my head. <laughs> I was just like, man, I don't, I have no idea. I think, I think there's a, a general miss. Okay, misunderstanding, or, or I guess it's not a misunderstanding because it's, it's an understandable um, confusion, but between computational design and machine learning. Yeah. Uh, and so I think a lot of people, when they think of machine learning, they, they're thinking more of the computational design, which would be running all the iterations of something and spitting right. them out. But machine, yeah. machine learning is doing that, but also learning from those and sort of and, and doing it itself yeah i guess yeah, yeah. Well, you know um, one of the things that we we talk about all the time uh, on the construction side is um you know we're looking we're, we're again like you mentioned we have tons of data and so we're mm-hmm. you know, we track progress in the field you know how fast is steel being installed yeah how much does it yep. cost all this stuff and so over time if you build a database big enough maybe that right. that can create a machine learning ecosystem where you can take a design from a from a structural engineer for example and you can spit out some suggestions with, you know, how to, it, it'll still be a design that works, but maybe it's a W8 by 10 instead of a W6, probably not a good example. Maybe it's a W12 you know, by 10 instead of a W8 by 30. Um, mm-hmm. It gives you the same structural response, but, you know, all of the data is telling us that that's going to produce a quicker, you know, er- erection or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so exactly. I think, but, but again, I think that's all, like we said, the question is now or in the future. I think that's still pretty future <laughs> yeah it is very yeah and and i i can see instances where that would be you know super valuable you know entirely possible mm-hmm. i just have no background like that's a that's like a four-year project you know to get <laughs> to get that to yeah. that point and it's doable yeah. but it's that's a whole discipline yeah. um, and again like i mentioned at the beginning as you start you start down this path and then you're like like I can't see the bottom and that's like a fork and yeah. that has an even, you know, a deeper side. So, um, there's, you know, super interesting problems mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that's, it's all, that's a career trajectory, um, onto mm-hmm. itself. And I think that that will probably, you know, that will be a, a viable, like, I don't know if firms will hire a machine learning cause machine learning people to, are right? super yeah. expensive, but, yeah. but yeah, you could start to see where, you know, certainly large firms that have mm-hmm. resources could start to bring somebody like that on board. Definitely. Sure. Uh, and a couple of people are asking about a link to your Autodesk course that you mentioned. So what I'll do is oh, yeah. um, I'll, I'll just post it in the description of the video after, after we're done, it'll be a recording on YouTube. Yeah. And then I'll, it, I'll, I'll send that to you. Yeah. So in the replay and then in the blog post as well, I'll have the link. So cool. any of the links yep. we mentioned, which obviously that's one of them as well as arcsmarter.com. Um, I'll put all of those in, in the, in there. Um, I'm just reading through a couple other comments. Looks like some people did out. take your Autodesk course. Sip of my drink. I know you, you, uh, you were doing so much demo, you didn't have time to take a sip. Right? I didn't have time. I know it's it's my beer is warm. You know, <laughs> um, one of, one of the questions that somebody had, which I answered via chat while you were talking, but I think it's something that you could probably uh, expand on a little bit. Um, maybe not with a live demo because I wouldn't I wouldn't want to do that either. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the question was um, from David, and he asked if there's a way to transpose, for example, a schedule um, rows and columns using the api or dynamo or one of those tools and you know my immediate answer was yes but um Mm -hmm. it's 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 i think when you think about the process of it i think it becomes a little more complicated but um but so you talk so so his question is i need to transpose columns and rows um so i guess pivoting kind of type of type of information yeah in that case i guess what if it would depend on what the output would be um, right and and what what the you know when you think about columns and rows and schedules in revit you're usually you it's know, parameter data yeah so if you're transposing it you're placing parameter data in the wrong location so you have to i think you have to set up your parameter where however you're feeding it back in has to be ready for that in revit right i mean yeah, I mean, I yeah. This, again um, this is very conceptual but <laughs> i mean one one thing that i've i've been doing a lot more on on my coding projects is just developing sort of custom data structures that I can put things into um, and then take them out whatever way I would want. And so I think in that instance, um, like the, I love the transpose node. That's one of my favorite nodes. Yes. Um, that and uh, filter by Boolean. Mm-hmm. Um, 
by Boolean mask. That's my other favorite one. But um, you know, that idea of turning something data inside out. I always like that when yeah. I feel like you're you're doing that. So in this instance, though, I think it would depend on what what the data was. Um, if you're if, you know if you're combining multiple things like rooms and walls or whatever, um, and then ultimately what you're what you're going to dump it out to. Right. Um, if, if, if your end goal is just an Excel sheet that has your schedule transposed. That's, transposed, yeah. You know, that's, that's a yeah, brainer. Yeah, totally. Bring right. it back you, in. Yeah, Dynamo. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> right. And then you may need to, you're going to have to do some various transformations of that. Right. Um, and I think like, like Dynamo, because it's list-based, um, you know, that that's where you run into that idea of transposing. Um, with coding, less so it's just a different like the way that the paradigm is different Mm -hmm. so you're not necessarily you're looping as opposed to handing off lists um, which was a hard thing for me to grasp to grok i should say uh when i started working in dynamo yeah awesome all right well i think we're uh we've about uh uh, automated everyone. Enough here. <laughs> so I was just waiting to see more Automated comments. out. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> somebody would call that a rock band called Mud Honey. So <laughs> cool. I'll have to look them up afterwards. <laughs> I guess my guitar is reminded them of that. Hey, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, for joining me. Hey, my um, pleasure. Thanks. Great. Man. I hope you guys enjoyed it out there, uh, watching this live or in the future. Um, I will post all of the links uh, in the description and uh, in the on, on the blog afterwards for the replay. And um, uh, you can find Michael at uh, arcsmarted.com. I mean, anywhere else that you want to mention. Uh, on Twitter, I think it's your name, right? At Michael Kilkelly. Yeah, I don't really hang out on Twitter that much anymore. But yes, it is. Yeah, that's so, or, probably not the best com. place. There we go. Yeah, Perfect. yeah. If you, Michael at arcsmarted.com. That's the best place. Awesome, I check awesome. that. Well, thank cool. you so much for joining me. Thank you, yeah, everyone out pleasure. there, for Thanks. joining us. Um, yep. And uh, I hope everyone is still safe and, and doing well in these weird times. I think maybe one day we'll get back to normal. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. Awesome. Well, thank you, thank you so much, Michael. And uh, yep. Thanks, Jeff. We're, we're going we're gonna to sign off now. And, uh, cool. And everyone, I'll see you next week. And feel free to reach out to any of us uh, to chit-chat, ask questions. We're pretty accessible people. <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye. Hey, that was fun.